All right, so this is a suggestion via a donation. The name of the video is, How Was England Formed? Let's check it out. Let's go. How was it formed? The existence of England is one that is often taken for granted and looked at far too scarcely. This may be due to the overshadowing history of the development of Great Britain and the United Kingdom. Right. But nonetheless, in order for these unions to be formed, England had to already exist, and it actually has since 927 AD. So how was England created? Who claimed the land before the English, and how did it become the nation that we know today? Huh. As the Roman Empire began to fade from the British Isles, the area of modern-day England started to... But I do think he already just kind of gave us the answer. He's referring to the Saxons and the Danes, uh, the Anglo-Saxons and the Danes, that ended up going to the Danish, etc., etc., right? Um, right? ...a wave of migration gave us the answer Anglo-Saxon Germanic tribes. Right. According to some historians, after the Romans left, the native Britons came under attack from the nearby... Also, uh, uh, Britons, I think it was spelled differently. It wasn't like how it's spelled now. Maybe T-O-N, maybe? After the Romans left, the native Britons came under attack from the nearby Picts and Scots and subsequently welcomed some of these Anglo-Saxons in hopes that they would push out the other invaders. Right. The Germanic but peoples didn't. were successful in expelling both the Scots and Picts, but they then turned on the native Britons and yeah. established their own authority by the start of the 7th century. The new Anglo-Saxon rulers then installed the kingdoms of Essex, Kent, Sussex, Mercia, East Anglia, Northumbria, and Wessex on the British mainland. There are minimal records of what happened over the next few centuries throughout these kingdoms, but we do know that it wouldn't be long before the Anglo-Saxons would face invaders of their own. The In Vikings. 793, a Viking army yeah. landed at the Lindisfarne Monastery and what? raided the sacred building. Their violence and disrespect stunned the Anglo-Saxons. Disrespect was not the word for what they did to the Anglo-Saxons, bro. That's, we need to come up with another word. We need to find another word to define the levels of disrespect. Because generally, if I think disrespect, I think I'm disrespected. I'm slightly offended. That wasn't disrespect. That was something different, bro. That, that was a wrong word to use here, sir. Who were unprepared for what these Vikings had in store. By the end of 870, East Anglia fell to the Danish okay. invaders, and Mercia was lost only four years later. As the Vikings seized Northumbria next in 875, Wessex was the only remaining major kingdom under Anglo-Saxon authority. When the current king of Wessex, Ethelred, died, his younger brother, Alfred, was left to protect his kingdom's independence. At first, he did so by paying off the Viking aggressors, until he was eventually prepared to lead an army against them. This culminated in the Battle of Eddington, which left the Danes utterly routed and ended their attempts to capture Wessex. A power vacuum in Mercia around the same time resulted- I wonder if Mercia in this Mercia has anything to do with uh, uh, Mercia in Spain in uh, Andalusia. Elton and King Alfred also gaining control of the kingdom, and instead of establishing a new monarch, he placed an alderman in charge. This nobleman would answer to King Alfred himself and kept the King of Wessex as the ultimate authority throughout both regions, although a part of Mercia would be ceded to the Vikings. After the death of the King of Wessex and the contemporary leader of Mercia in 911, Edward the Elder and Ethel fled each became the respective successors. Together, these new rulers began to increase the pressure that had already been put on the neighboring Dane law. In 917, Ethelflaed expanded her lands to the north, and Edward was able to incorporate all of East Anglia into his kingdom. As Ethelflaed pushed forward with the expansion, she managed to extend Mercian territory all the way up to York, where the locals decided it would be best to simply pledge loyalty to her as opposed to fighting. Although Ethelflaed shortly died, her daughter, Elfwyn, yeah, was supposed to take her place you, and continue on the current course. Unexpectedly, though, the Mercian people quickly ousted their new leader and accidentally created the perfect opportunity for King Edward from Wessex right, to, to seize all of Mercia not long after. In 918, 
the Anglo-Saxons continued farther Not into Danelaw territory and slowly gained more and more land for themselves. By the time of Edward's death in 924, the newly acquired neighbors of the Anglo-Saxons had all pledged allegiance to the king. This put the Anglo-Saxons in a confident position as Edward's son, Ethelstan, took over the kingdom. Around this time, Ethelton's sister would marry the local Viking ruler, Citric, who still controlled Northumbria. Ethelstan marched on and was finally able to bring the Kingdom of York under his crown as his sister's husband passed away. This left Northumbria up for grabs and the king swiftly consolidated it as part of his kingdom. This is generally the time that most historians view the Kingdom of England as having been created. But the situation was not exactly so simple. Ethelstan was not done trying to expand his kingdom however he could, and although he did term himself the King of the English at this point, it was still- Guys, keep in mind, they really didn't speak English. All right, King of the English, but not- they didn't speak anything that we would, I think, understand normally. Oh, not quite what we know as England today. Ethelstan decided to give an invasion of Scotland a chance to see if he could reach his authority even further. The Kingdom of Scotland, or as it was known at the time, Alaba, was at a disadvantage against the English and therefore appealed to the other remaining sovereign states for assistance. This prompted an alliance between Constantine II, King of Alaba, Olaf Guthrison, King of Dublin, and Owain, King of Strathclyde. With King Olaf at the helm, the Alliance faced the English at the spectacular Battle of Brunnenburg. Though it is unknown exactly where this battle took place, it is certain that the Alliance was severely crushed by the English invaders. The casualties on both sides was disastrously high, but Ethelstan and the English were without a doubt the victors. It's believed by many that this clash may have truly solidified the unity of England and stirred up a new sense of nationalism and pride amongst the English people. Nonetheless, it didn't result in the incorporation of Alaba nor Strathclyde into the Kingdom of England, as both stayed independent. England, on the other hand, would have to prove its ability to do so. The Vikings, though temporarily defeated, would return to the Young Kingdom at the end of the 10th century. After Ethelstan's death in 939, the previously defeated King of Dublin, who was a Viking ruler, took immediate advantage of England's temporary instability. While King Ethelstan's brother Edmund took over the English realm, King Olaf swooped in to reconquer some of the lands that had once been in Viking hands. York was quickly captured and a large chunk of what used to be Northumbria and Mercia was also taken, as he strong-armed the English into accepting this annexation. Ironically, when Olaf died in 941 and his cousin, who shared the same name, was transitioning to the throne as his successor, Edmund of England jumped on the chance to pay the Vikings back for the invasion. The following year, the middle chunk of yeah, Annex land was mandatory. taken by the English, and in only two more years, the Vikings were entirely pushed out of Northumbria. This essentially reunited England, since the territory was now all under Edmund's control. As ambitious as his ancestors, Edmund next invaded Strathclyde, but only took some of its southern territories by the end of the incursion. The rest was given to King Malcolm I of Scotland, as opposed to joining England. It once again appeared as though the Kingdom of England had established some stability. But this was once more short-lived. Edmund was mysteriously murdered in 946, which left his younger brother he wasn't mysterious Edric, as deleted, king bro. of England. The next year, Eric Bloodaxe from Norway attacked and seized the recently reincorporated Northumbria, which prompted almost a decade of conflicts over who throughout the Isles would lead Northumbria. Eventually, the English king was able to once again and permanently reclaim the territory on behalf of England. His death soon ended his reign after this victory, and his young nephew Edwig temporarily succeeded him, but was quickly deposed in favor of his brother Edgar. However, this was only a partial deposition, which meant that Edwig would still hold a small section of the kingdom as a co-ruler. When Edwig died only two years after this decision, Edgar simply took over the whole of England. 
Under the reign of King Edgar, known as Edgar the Peaceful, the true foundations of the English kingdom could finally be established. Many reforms were passed, and a vast number of the systems and laws that had existed in the Dane law were actually upheld in hopes of avoiding any displeasure from the Danish portion of the population. Peace, unity, and order were the pillars of Edgar's nearly two decades long the peaceful. reign. Like, it's, it was a good idea. Like, it is a very specific era in our history. Um, that was a very good idea because think about this here. You take over a country and then you have a an entire country that's flooded with different overall peoples of you know people of different origins, right? Uh, if you completely ostracize them and say, hey, listen, all of what you've ever, ever uh, dealt with and known in life is now going to be thrown away. I don't care about your practices or culture, right? No, you have to kind of give a little bit to, to get a little bit, right? I mean, so um, that was absolutely amazing for him to, to really do at this time. I didn't, wouldn't have expected um, someone to do anything like this, honestly. Um, it's uh, it's very, uh, you know, very forward thinking, let's say, um, to understand fully that if you don't give a little bit, right? All you're going to deal with is now people that are going to take you out and then take more land because obviously England is being fought, has been fought over since the beginning of time. And his work helps to fully solidify the By unity everyone of the locally. young kingdom of England. The ultimate foundation of England was a long and shaky process. From the initial immigration of the Anglo-Saxons into the region to the establishment of their first kingdoms extending into the invasion and rule of the Vikings, it wasn't Multiple until invasions. the Anglo-Saxons began to seize territory from the Danelov that an inkling of modern-day England could be seen. After a series of conquering, being conquered, reconquering and so on, the Anglo-Saxons eventually united the existing kingdoms throughout England. From there, it was merely a matter of establishing solid borders, maintaining their captured territory in order to keep their kingdom physically solid, and eventually, under the rule of Edgar the Peaceful, building the foundational laws and structures of what we know now as the kingdom or nation of England. <laughs> Guys. He, as a presenter, is very good. Um, I love this animation style that he used here. Um, it, this is a really good way for people to learn about things that they may not know or may not even think they need to know, right? Um, I think I'm starting to like geography more than I probably ever have. Uh, with, with a couple of these videos that you guys have been sending me, um, there's a couple, there's, there are bits and pieces of this that I've never heard. Um, I have heard a good amount of this story. Um, I guess not a story, the history of England, but not so much, not in depth. Um, and he doesn't go like too deep to the point where it becomes convoluted, right? Uh, and overly complex, let's say. He's a very good presenter, guys. No complaints here. Um, but all right, listen, now let me know in the comments of the next thing uh, from him um, that I should be checking out. Or if there are any other countries that he has done, I definitely would be interested in checking it out. Maybe some that are maybe lesser known. England is extremely known, guys. Right? Um, but yeah, you guys all have an absolutely amazing day and enjoy your day thoroughly.